Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for attending this panel. And uh, I want to say thank you to the Armory as well for inviting us here today. Uh, be actually, before I start the panel, I'd like to uh, ask for a small favor. If all the men in the room can rise with me, can all the men please stand up? <laughs> and can we all celebrate the wonderful women in the room today and give them a round of applause? Thank you very much. Tu n'étais pas attendu à ça, n'est-ce pas? Alors, je vous en prie. Uh, I'm very proud to be here today with wonderful people on the panel. I'd like to introduce them very quickly. Uh, Pulani, who's late, but it's fine. Pulani Kingston, collector and advisory board member, Zaid Smoka, Cape Town. I went to Cape Town to the opening of the Zaid Smoka. Congratulations, brilliant museum. Thank you. Uh, Ahmad Mater, Dr. Ahmad Mater, artist and director of the MISC Art Institute in Riyadh. Catherine Petigaz, collector and philanthropist, chair, Tate International Council. And Thibaut Poutrel, collector and philanthropist as well. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, so as you know, this panel is about cultural capitals and the importance of capitals collecting art and what benefits it gives to the community and the message it gives also to the world. So my first question is um, addressed to Catherine. What is, in your opinion, a cultural capital? Well, yeah, thank you very much, all of you, for being here, first of all, and I hope that you will be able to understand my somewhat pronounced uh, accent, but I will try to make an effort to, to be uh, intelligible. Uh, I must say, Ali, uh, I was really pleased when I saw the subject of the uh, topic that you've chosen today, because it reminded me of one of the exhibitions that I admire the most, and which I think is a seminal exhibition, which is the first exhibition that uh, ever took place uh, at, uh, at the Tate, when the Tate opened uh, in, uh, in uh, 2001, that is entitled Century City, Art and Culture of the, of the Modern uh, Metropolis. It was an exhibition curated by uh, Ivona Blaswick, who is now the director of, uh, of um, the Whitechapel Gallery in London. And uh, basically it proposed nine cities to retrace the 20th century, uh, nine cities that were very much uh, sort of Western-oriented, very European. So it was Paris and Vienna for the first part of the, of the century, Moscow uh, for the 1916-30, Rio, uh, Lagos for 1955-70, Tokyo, New York, London, and Mumbai. And I must say that uh, this exhibition for me is a sort of blueprint to help us think of what could be the cultural capitals of the 21st century. And uh, of course, in that list that I, I just read, the big absence are, uh, first of all, uh, Asia and China in particular, but uh, perhaps uh, more topically today, uh, the Middle East. There isn't a single city of the Middle East. And there is only, Africa. Uh, only one of Africa, which is Lagos. Uh, and there is actually an excellent um, essay by Okwi and Weso uh, on this uh, Lagos between 1955 and 1970. So I think if we think of what the cultural capital of the 21st century is going to be, I think it's, it's, um, it's perhaps a good inspiration to start looking at this book. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say in answer to your question is that uh, I have um, published a few books, I've edited a few books for our common friend, uh, Jose in Amir Sadeghi for Transglobe, looking at the contemporary art scene of uh, Brazil, Mexico, and, and Colombia. And uh, we have defined five criteria to look at what is an art center. And I think maybe this could be a good uh, point of, of conversation. And the five criteria are that there needs to be artists, obviously, first and foremost. Uh, there needs to be collectors obviously, and I'm one of them. Uh, there needs to be galleries. Uh, galleries, I think, for me, are also essential, and I think that uh, collectors should always buy through galleries. Uh, and uh, uh, the third, the fourth element is institutions. Uh, museums uh, are super important. And the fifth element, which I think we must not forget, is art schools. 
there's, there needs to be uh, a sort of critical approach to the art. Although, and I think this makes a sort of a fairly fragile ecosystem, uh, but we need one of each of these five uh, elements to create, in my view, uh, a very a successful cultural capital. And perhaps that's what I would um, um, question in the Middle East, where sometimes there, is, there are very strong institutions, there may be galleries, there may be artists, sometimes there isn't enough of the critical approach, there isn't enough of the art school or education. But I'm just being provocative. No, it's fine. But you you didn't mention foundations and uh, auctions. Yeah. Uh, well, I would uh, uh, bring galleries and auctions as part of the commercial, the commercial area, entity. and collectors and foundations also in a sort of. A and may I similar. ask you why did you choose these three countries specifically in South America or in Central America and South America? Uh, well, uh, it's somewhat self-serving. Uh, I'm uh, primarily a collector of uh, contemporary art from Latin America. So I have uh, developed, I suppose, um, some expertise in the region. Uh, and I chose uh, Brazil and Mexico, of course, as the leading two countries of the region. Uh, and then Colombia, uh, because I think Colombia is a sort of a test case of how art can change society, uh, how art can reconcile a society that is coming out of uh, almost 60 years of civil war after the peace agreement. So that's, that's why I thought Colombia was really interesting. I hope Havana will be next on your list. Which one? Havana. <laughs> Havana, Cuba. Yes, Cuba. of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Pulani. Yeah. I'd like to ask you about the uh, importance for developing countries. H how important is it for developing countries to establish an art infrastructure, in your case specifically, in Cape Town? Okay, so thank you very much. And once more, I apologize for my slight delay. <laughs> um, if I might just add, before I answer your question, to the, the, the five criteria that Catherine um, raised, in particular in the context of Africa, which is the continent that I understand the best. I think I would separate um, the art schools into two. The first, obviously, are art schools at university level or tertiary school level. But I do think that there is something to be said which is critically important in the context of having a feeder system of school art level training. So much earlier in terms of the school curriculum. And while this is generally available in the African context insofar as private paying fee-paying schools are concerned, I think that this needs to definitely be expanded into the, into the public sector uh, free state schooling system. And then the second one, of course, from my perspective, and given the history of South Africa in particular, which is only 24 years into its democracy, is in the context of art fairs. So just to explain why I say this is important, um, the apartheid system in South Africa, which only ended legally 24 years ago, created a situation where um, access to these public spaces was denied. And as a consequence of that, many black people who formed the majority of, of South Africans do not feel, feel comfortable attending um, museums, or uh, galleries, etc. So I do think that, um, that uh, from the perspective of art fairs, it's important and they feel far more comfortable coming in. As a consequence of that, the art fairs in South Africa, we have two every year, tend to be far more educational in their output. So you have people who come as collectors to buy art, but the vast majority of people who actually attend art fairs are the younger generation, aspirant collectors who actually come to learn. So I think that's, that's an important one to, to point out. So, sorry to interrupt you, but do you think art fairs play the role more than biennials in that context that you're talking about, the people of South Africa feeling maybe intimidated to enter the museums? Do you think the art fairs will help break this uh, habit or perhaps or make them more comfortable to enter the art world or a biennial or maybe uh, uh, some institutions or foundations? So I think that it's all of the above. Um, what is, uh, what the, I think a biennial would help tremendously in, in, in enabling access and in making fee people feel comfortable enough to want to attend and to see what, what it is or to see themselves in the artworks that are produced. The only problem with South Africa is that we haven't had a biennial in years. I think the last one was in the early 90s. So there is something to be said for looking at 
having or hosting a biennial. Um, the only other biennial that I'm aware of um, on the continent is the Dakar Art Biennial, and in addition to that, there was a biennial in Marrakesh which did not proceed um, um, this year. So yes. Uh, a similar, a similar um, project has been, uh, 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 well, they started it in Saudi Arabia, actually, the Saudi Art Council. Uh, if you can tell us a bit more about it, uh, Dr. Ahmed, about how the 2139, it is not an art fair, it is not a biennial, but how did it help also the community in Saudi Arabia to enter the art world and to start appreciating contemporary art more? I think, uh, yes, uh, especially if we talk about the ecosystem or about the cultural policy uh, in all of the countries, I think uh, such a project which can stand in between, like for example, Biennial, which is like more in the, on the census of cultural and non-commercial, but also at the same time like art fair, which is one of the ecosystem or one of the uh, things. Something happening in the middle, this is like what happening like 2139. It's an effort by families from the region that they decide together to build something that can grasp the attention of artists who they are working in the underground scene, plus the collectors, plus the visitors, plus the invite from everywhere their guests. So I think such a project is important nowadays in many of countries. We need to work on the edge between what we know. I think this is the first example of its kind where the community, the families of Jeddah, yes. raised funds and made this project happen every year. Even, even from 70s, I usually call that from 70s, Jeddah present itself like the, the open museum. And you will find all of this culture. Maybe you see it, Ali. So it was, it's the history repeat himself in this, which is amazing. You know, like if you see all of these famous sculptures in Jeddah on the streets, and maybe no one know about because 70s, it was like the high by this time, but now within 2139 Saudi Art, uh, Art Council, they, they make a lot, a lot of, uh, for me as an artist, a lot of successful move. I must say the first time I visited Jeddah about uh, 20 years ago, maybe, or 15 years ago, and I saw the beautiful sculptures of Henry Moore on the beach of Jeddah and of uh, uh, Miro also had some sculptures. I mean, it, it, it's really phenomenal that this was bought back in the 70s or even the late 60s, I think, at the time by the mayor, Mr. Farsi. Yes. Um, right, and, and uh, these artworks are now being restored and put back in a sculpture garden in Jeddah, correct? Yeah. Incredible. This was in the 70s back then. Yeah. Thibault, I'd like to ask you about, uh, about do, artists, do artists need to change their language to be understood? Don't we all? <laughs> um, I think in the end, you know, the work of the artist is always to try to express, you know, whatever idea he had in his mind. Could be trying to express political ideas, could be trying to express emotions or just a new aesthetic approach. And plastic, eventually, is just a way of expressing yourself. It's just a language. So now, if you, you know, like we collectors do, um, travel around the world, um, you will find difficulties finding, you know, understanding probably the depth of the message. Uh, of, of a given artist, I had, I had typically, I was in India for the you know, Delhi Art Fair three weeks ago and I was had, having a very hard time understanding many, many of the local artists simply because they didn't have the, you know, the tools and uh, it can be difficult. Um, in the end, uh, any artistic process is a lot about you know, having difficulties of expressing what you have to say to the general public, which brings you know, the debate to intermediation, for instance. I'm talking more about aesthetics uh, versus politics, for example. You know, yeah. a lot of times where we, I, I personally, I've even been invited to uh, be on many panels or on many uh, uh, councils to collect art for institutions or museums. And I got out of them because all they buy is political art. Like I'm from Lebanon and all the artists they buy from Lebanon are, you know, demolished homes and, uh, you know, ravaged cities and so on and so forth. This is not the image I'd like to portray. So. Again, does political art strike the deal and make people want to go to museums? And is this the way that we want to portray our image that our, our... What I meant to say is, if it's really political, it works. And if it's not political, it doesn't work as good, uh, as well. 
Political art is always a lingua franca because you know whenever you travel, um, typically we, you know, Catherine and I are interested in Latin America, so you will find many artists talking about decolonization, uh, talking about urban violence, and you know anybody can relate to that. If you, uh, especially if you start digging into the roots of any culture, it's you know antique uh, culture, which is sometimes very difficult to uh, translate in other languages. Sometimes you have religious roots, which are simply difficult to you know explain to people who are not sharing the, the, the same religious beliefs. It's, it's quite a lot of, of translation, actually. Um, you literally have to dig into each artist's work to understand what he's you know, been telling to you. It's not a matter of English or you know, um, vernacular language. It's, it's getting deeper and deeper. And you can have that even with an artist you know, from your own country, to some extent. What is, what is the majority of the art that you collect, like the, the nationalities or maybe the region, if we talk about the region? Is it Latin as well? Latin, 60%, say 70%. So why did you and Catherine decide to focus on Latin American art. What did you find that is different than, for example, Middle Eastern contemporary art or Asian contemporary art or African contemporary art? Uh, well, uh, I think it's a mix of personal reasons and uh, talent that you can find there. In my case, I had been living in Mexico many years ago, uh, really fell in love with Mexico. And then when we, I, I, was, I, was, I had a career as a banker at the time, but when I, I moved out of there and decided to uh, collect more seriously, it seemed natural to focus in an area where uh, we felt that we understood the humor, we understood the idiosyncrasies, uh, and it was also also in the late 80s, early 2000, uh, a time when quite a few uh, important um, artists from Latin America were really um, taking a more important place on the international stage. But perhaps to answer more directly your question, or do artists need to change their language to, to be understood, um, is uh, perhaps another way of looking at it is looking at the local versus the global. And uh, I, is, I believe very strongly that uh, perhaps the most uh, powerful art is an art that is local, that, have very, that has very strong roots uh, in its uh, own idiosyncrasies, but then can develop a message that is universal. And I think for me, that's the art that I like collecting. And there are many examples of this uh, in Mexico in particular, or in Colombia, for example, at this stage of uh, uh, coming out of these years of violence. And I think this become a symbolic work that can be understood uh, universally. And I think that is the key to great art, I would think, in, in my view. Um, I love what you said about the DNA of the artwork. So what you say, you collect art that is very entrenched in the DNA of the country that uh, uh, you buy from, yes. that it originates from. Well, it's exactly the case that I saw in the museum at Zaid Smoka in, um, in uh, uh, Cape Town. So if you can tell me a little bit about some of the artworks or some of the artists that were dedicated an entire floor at the museum because of the strong uh, DNA of African contemporary um, history. Okay, thank you. So I think just as a backdrop to that, um, the Zaid Smoka Museum, which is uh, the Museum of Contemporary African Art, opened in Cape Town in September of last year. And it's the largest um, museum of contemporary African art in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this was also the first, the, the consequence of the opening of this museum was that for the first time in the history of South Africa, we had significant and major players in the international art market visit Cape Town. Such was its significance. Um, in terms of the artists themselves that are displayed, um, or whose work is, is, is displayed or exhibited at uh, the Zaidsmoka Museum, there is an entire floor that is dedicated to South African artists, artists such as Mary Sibanda, whose work is simply magnificent, um, uh, work by masters such as uh, Penny Sayopis, who's an, uh, an abstract artist. And what's important, I mentioned these two artists in particular, um, what is important about them is that their work is deeply, deeply rooted in the DNA of South African society. So Mary Sibanda's work, who happens to be represented by Gallery Momo, um, her work focuses on the trials and tribulations of her mother, who was a domestic worker. And Penny work talks to what, what it is to be a woman, both in uh, 
uh, uh, apartheid South Africa, as well as in a post-colonial South Africa. So the work there, while it is, while some of it is not is not uh, can be, can be read in different ways because it is multi multi-layered, but at the end of the day, it truly does speak to where South Africa is in terms of its social political development. And um, thank you for this, uh, Pulani. I want to ask Ahmed, Saudi Arabia is working a lot on changing its image right now. You're documenting currently the very rapid change of Saudi Arabia in your artwork. But I know how difficult it is today to enter Saudi Arabia. What is the government doing to facilitate this? Because it's always, it's always been a taboo, Saudi Arabia, especially now with contemporary art. There's a lot of curious collectors and institutions who would like to go and visit and see what is the contemporary Saudi art like? And, and how does the government facilitate that, whether it be visas or, uh, you know, uh, it's still a taboo. Can women enter? How can they um, uh, contact these museums, these institutions? So if you can give us a bit of a scene of the contemporary art today in Saudi. Yeah, thank you so much. This is really important and it's a spot on question. So uh, actually, yes, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, it's not changing uh, its image. It's really changing from inside. It's the most energetic and fastest change that I ever seen as an artist before anything. As an artist, and when we talk about art, art usually will not follow anything. The artist will not make something to please anyone. Art will reflect what's happening in our society, in our life. So what's happening, it's really change. It's very energetic time. Change is really, really uh, happening. Uh, if, 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 if we take it f uh, by numbers, you know, Saudi, 75 of Saudi population younger than 35 age. So it's very young country. So imagine how, you know, how we think about future of country that really want to change. They are the most consumption for social media, you know. It's a country full of millennials. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, Twitter, you know, like uh, the, the, the production and the YouTube, maybe all of these things make a new generation. And that's why I think something will happen new in art and culture. And that, for me, is very positive as an artist to think about what comes next in the art how the new way of art will communicate, or what about the 21st century organization, art organization or foundation or museum will look like? And that's the big question that will come through the change. And maybe Saudi Arabia is a part of this change, but if we think about the world, it's, the change is a little bit, you know, big question. Sometimes we ask about the left side becoming more in Europe, we ask ourselves why? or the right becoming more, you know, why? Saudi Arabia trying to do push a new kind of a change, you know? All of us watching, all of us part of this change, so, yeah. Now, I must congratulate you as a nation. Uh, it, it blew my mind when I saw the artworks, when I saw the, the collections, and I saw the, the beautiful, thriving art scene. And you know how every region in the world has its ups and downs. I think this is the time of Saudi Arabia contemporary art. I, I hope so. And the regarding the visas and things, w last yesterday in, in UK, I don't know if you see the news, they opened the visa for, uh, they brought, for and uh, now we invite everyone. It's much, much easier now for everyone to visit. And, uh, and a lot of museums visit Saudi Arabia last six months. It's brilliant. It's like brilliant. more than any time before. Just go when the weather is good. Don't go in the summer. <laughs> uh, I, I want to ask uh, Thibault and Catherine a question about the role of the patron or the collector. I know there's a difference between a collector and a difference between, and a patron. You know, a collector is a collector. A patron has much more. The agenda is much more bigger for a patron. Um, but are patrons becoming curators today? I see that patrons have this have this responsibility today as curators. So can you tell me a little bit more about that? The role. I think collectors um, have to do a you know, uh, comprehensive job as curators uh, alongside with the curators of your major institutions, so they have to do exactly the same work, basically study, find, select, acquire, and eventually show, you know, either by you know, sharing, learning, or even doing, organizing your own shows, like Catherine and I occasionally do. Um, eventually it's the same process, and uh, also they contribute uh, you know, 
you know, quite a lot in the creation of uh, what could be a good corpus of a collection simply by acquiring, uh, you know, by putting the means that the, that the, that the regular institutions don't really have. And Catherine, yes. what do you think of that? Yes, if uh, collectors need to be curator, yes, yes, please. <laughs> Actually, Thibaut here has invited me to curate uh, part of his uh, collection of art from Colombia. We've uh, shown it in Miami. Uh, we've shown it in, uh, in uh, Madrid uh, just uh, two weeks ago at Arco. We might show it again uh, in Colombia. So I, on the side, this is my foible. I love curating. But I think on a more sort of um, uh, uh, symbolic um, uh, manner, I think that's not really your, uh, your, the question that you're asking. Uh, I think uh, it goes to the, the point of uh, what is a collector? What, uh, what is the difference between a collector and a hoarder of artworks? And for me, the difference is really that a collector has a duty of patronage. And it's true that this patronage can help shape the collections of institutions. Uh, I think Thibault and I are both on the committee of the Latin American American Acquisitions Committee at the Tate, uh, the Tate with whom uh, in London, with whom I'm uh, very closely involved, has been quite a precursor in launching these uh, acquisitions committees. Uh, the first one was in 2002. It was the Latin American Acquisitions Committee, so it's now uh, 16 years old, uh, followed by MENAC, the Middle East and North Africa Ac Acquisitions Committee, a very good uh, and very active uh, African Acquisitions Committee as well. Uh, and therefore, when you you are part of these groups, um, you uh, contribute an annual amount to um, contribute to a pot that uh, then enables the museum to buy works, but that's not the uh, essential part of it. I think what is really key is that you also belong to a group of like-minded people uh, who have access to information, to research, uh, to uh, market data like no other, and uh, that can really uh, help uh, propose the, uh, the, the institution in the market. It's not easy for institutions to be market players. And with the, uh, the support of the collectors, I think they really um, uh, manage to make a difference. So I think through these uh, acquisitions committees, that's one example of how the collector can uh, help shape a collection. So in that way, the collector becomes, uh, uh, you know, vicariously a sort of a curator because it ha he helps cur curate the collection of, uh, of an institution. And the same could be said of the Centre Pompidou that uh, then followed suit with Acquisitions Committee. Of course, MoMA here, um, I think, think of uh, someone like um, Patricia Phelps de Cisneros, uh, who gave um, an important collection of Latin American works to MoMA, but also promoted the presentation of Latin American works alongside the Western canon, alongside, you know, the, the big masters, so Elio Itisica on the same plan as Mondrian. Uh, I think uh, in that sense, that's also a collector who has been a curator for a museum. So I would say, yes, collectors have a duty, I think, Institutions don't really like us to mingle too much, but uh, we really love to do it, so <laughs> they can't get rid of us. <laughs> Cultural capital is, of course, a manifestation. Anyone who, any, any country or any nation who collects art uh, and, and uh, promotes it, it's obviously a manifestation in order to enhance the image of its region. And I would like to ask Polani, how did the Zaitz Mocha, if I remember correctly, it was the largest museum of contemporary African art in all of Africa, the continent. So how does it, oh, what did it, what goodness did it do to the, uh, to the image of South Africa worldwide? I think first of all, um, it certainly showcased uh, South Africa in its entirety, as well as not only in terms of the country and people being interested in South Africa as a destination for holidays, etc., but also in the context of its uh, incredible artistic talent, which resides in South Africa. I think that what it also did, which is critically important given the history of South Africa that I spoke about, was that it also enabled South Africans who have not had access to art to actually begin to see what contemporary art actually looks like. So while we have your established galleries um, in South Africa, such as the Goodman Gallery, Gallery Momo, Stevenson, Blank Projects, uh, What If The World, etc., the reality is that very few people go to those galleries. 
the consequence of the establishment and the opening of, the, of Zatz Mokka is that you have 47,000 people a month who attend the, 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 the Zatz Mokka in order to see themselves, to see that actually there is more than just historic and modern art that's being created. There is, there is real, um, uh, there is a vibrant contemporary art scene in, in South Africa, which includes photography, which includes uh, performing arts. So it it's really is a centerpiece, which obviously could never survive without the existing ecosystem, uh, which we strive to improve on a daily basis. And if I ask all of you, actually, what is the role of the Museum of the Future? 2018 and beyond, what is the role of the museum? What should the museum change today in order to attract more people and for the message to be more uh, universal? Uh, well, um, I have very strong views about this, so <laughs> maybe you regret that you ever asked. No, no, no. <laughs> but, We're not uh, recording. <laughs> I think that uh, when I was, uh, when I, I, I transitioned from being in banking to being in a, in a sort of more active uh, art collector, I first did an, uh, a course at Christie's, and uh, and my uh, thesis there um, at the end of the course was um, uh, entitled "The Museum of Modern Art: A Cathedral." or a zoo. And uh, actually, I think there is still a lot to be said about this, because a cathedral or a zoo is not a cinema, it's not a place of entertainment. I think that uh, the museum has a role of being a, a place of uh, perhaps uh, some form of spirituality. I think that can be debated, but certainly as a place of education. And I, strong, I, I believe very strongly on, uh, in this. I think, you know, there is always this debate where between experiment, exper, exper, experience and education in a museum, but for me, I think it has to be about education. And I think that uh, the museum uh, is a great place to think of uh, cre education creatively. And I think that's the way we need to engage people. I completely agree with you, that, uh, Pauline, that uh, museums still remain uh, elitist or seen as elitist. And for me, I think the key to that is to promote more live art. I think that there, there needs to be uh, and more new media. I think new media and live art are really the key to the museum of the future. I think it's also a place where the museum can compete with uh, the uh, super well-funded foundation and commercial galleries that can put up multi-million uh, dollar shows that the museum cannot do at this stage. And I think that uh, by focusing on this role as education and live art, I think that's, uh, that's, uh, um, that's going to be an essential part of, uh, of the museum. As it happens, uh, and I don't want to plug my own interest, of course not, but uh, I, I'm launching at the Tate uh, a fund, which is a performance fund, to activate the permanent collection of, um, of um, uh, uh, performance pieces that the Tate has so that whenever the, 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 the visitor comes to the museum, the museum has part of the program that is live art. Because at the end of the day, you know, since, the, since 1909, I think we've said that museums are mausoleums. And you know what? They still are most of the time. So I think we need so to So how to break that? This. this is exactly what I'm asking. How to change the role of a museum into something much more exciting for many more people to come and visit and to learn from yes. the museum. Yes, uh, as I was saying... What's the magic formula? Yes, well, I don't think... You have to be careful of not dumbing down. I think it's not so much the number of visitors. It's not Disney World, okay? If people want to, <laughs> to have fun, maybe they should go to Disney World. I think they, they have to bring... to take something away, you know? It's not just entertainment. And that's why I think that in particular uh, video art, digital art uh, and diversity. performance art. Diversity. And, and also diversity, uh, you know, perhaps more, uh, I think this is a point that you want to discuss later on, but uh, interacting with a, a very contemporary creation is also a way uh, perhaps to engage and to make art less intimidating. But anyway, I don't want to... <laughs> Thibault, wanted to say something, I think, about that point? Yeah, just, just to answer the question, I think the, the Museum of the, the Future will have broken walls, basically, so it should be easier than ever to enter. I see two ways of doing this. First, you have to decentralize. You have to open um, you know, more 
um, you know, secondary spaces maybe attached to the major institutions. And the main museums in Paris actually have been, you know, pioneering the Louvre and the Pompidou by doing offshoots uh, either at home or uh, overseas. And this is going probably to accelerate and I'm pretty sure, you know, other museums, other major uh, museums worldwide are going to do the same, which is one thing. And second, I, th um, I think this is a urbanistic and architectural debate, but I think more and more cultural spaces are going to be embedded in like multi-model uh, buildings. I've actually been working on, on, on one project in Paris, uh, Eastern Paris, and the more you do that, the more you blend, you know, like cultural spaces inside open architectures. Uh, multimedia. Yes. Sorry? Multimedia, multi-activity. No. That, that too, but even, even just from a, one architectural you know, standpoint, you could just you know, have one floor in a very open building where there is, there is also you know, a hotel which guarantees that you know, foreigners can come in and out. Um, and just, just something that's open to the neighborhood as well, that's very important. Not, not, uh, you have to integrate it to the, the local scene, the city scene, and then to the international scene as well. So the, the uh, cultural capital is, of course, the best way to manifest and to show the, the, uh, the art of a region is either attending biennials, you know, when, when, when governments showcase the best they have at the biennials, or perhaps uh, traveling museums, traveling collections, and of course art fairs uh, like here today at the Armory Show, but also social media is also a great window today. So uh, a lot of artists today are showing their the best work. Some of them just have fun with Instagram, like uh, Maurizio Catalan, for example, the single, I don't know if you follow Maurizio, phenomenal uh, Instagram account, Maurizio Catalan, who only posts one artwork per day and then he deletes it immediately. So it's called the one artwork post, I think, the one artwork Instagram. Other nations have also uh, used the, um, uh, you know, the media, social media, such as YouTube and Instagram, etc., to showcase the best they have. And I think the, the, uh, the efforts made by galleries to travel also around the world is also part of, part of cultural capital. Today, we have uh, two Middle Eastern galleries in, uh, in uh, the armory, uh, Leila Heller, Gallery, who's also based out of New York, and Lori Shabibi, uh, who's based in Dubai. And uh, it takes a lot of effort also for these emerging countries, such as, you know, countries of the Middle East, in the realm of contemporary art, and Africa, and Latin America, perhaps. It takes a lot of effort, time, and money to spend to travel all around the world and to exhibit. So there's also a big part on the collectors to visit these art fairs and these biennials and to promote. But when you collect established artists is one thing, it's one responsibility, but you have a bigger responsibility when you collect emerging artists. So what is the role that you have as, I'm assuming you collect emerging artists from Latin America. Mostly. So what, are, what is the criteria and how do you use that to promote Latin America? I think in my case at least I try to, uh, either when I collect or when I show, um, I try to actually mix younger artists with established artists. So I'm not, you know, Patricia Phelps de Cisneros yet, but I'm trying. Um, so I've actually done you know, two self-curated exhibitions at my place and one uh, with Catherine. And we've pretty much mixed, you know, every generation, every level, you know, of, uh, of fame. And uh, just because it was important to, um, just because it was part of the, of, of the proposition, basically, it was the topic that was important, not the fame of the artist. And by blending them and, you know, in, inserting them into the continuum, uh, I think we're basically helping them the best we can. Thank you very much. I think we can open the floor to some questions. If anybody has any question about uh, visas to Saudi Arabia, Ahmed can sign the, the, the deal today. Or if you have any questions about the efforts that uh, the government of uh, the United Arab Emirates is doing, I don't know if you're familiar with the, um, the artistic activities happening in the UAE, whereby we have a biennial in Sharjah. We have a very active art scene in Dubai mostly commercial art scene, and then we have also a beautiful museum that recently opened in Abu Dhabi, the, the Louvre Abu Dhabi. The art infrastructure in the United Arab, Arab Emirates is becoming extremely vibrant, and we have a big art fair also happening next week. Um, if you have any questions to any of the panelists, please. Um, hi, my name is John Keppel, I'm an artist, and. I, I have kind of a theory going on, and I wondered what you guys thought about this when you were talking about the future of museums. Um, basically, it's just the idea that 
as I've understood it the last hundred years, um, there's been a movement towards blending art with reality with different objects using like Duchamp with his ready-mades and the Brillo boxes of Warhol and countless other performances and so forth through net art and land art that kind of like has escaped the, the structure of galleries and museums. And when you started talking about the future of museums, it got me excited when you talked about, uh, it sounded like living, light, programming, education, and sometimes I envision down the road there being more of, through this practice of art is life, through social media we share kind of our life experiences and almost kind of like a kind of character building that people are art themselves. And I sometimes think maybe museums could be a place of congregation for idea sharing, which is similar to like what we're doing here. I love going out and seeing the plasticity as well, the objects, but I just really feel like there's something special with ideas, with idea sharing and conversation and the generative power of that. And I just wondered what you thought, if you think that down the road there might be a de-emphasis on objecthood in a museum setting, do you think there's potential for that and what that could look like for a museum down the road? Uh, Interesting to hear uh, yeah. Ahmed's view I, on this. <laughs> I think this is very important. Uh, uh, today, I, one of the things that really I like when you spoke about as a museum can be a spiritual place, but this is very important because to know wh where is the museum set now? Is it, is it this religious, spiritual place, or is it this? I think, I think also, from what you say, museum could be the laboratory. Mm -hmm. You know, why? Museum should, if, if it if it's needs to be alive, I think it should lead the experimentation, the test to be a testing place, like before. Other museum to be the place that really, you know, like, give the new things. It's not just only about social or about technology. Technology will follow, will enjoy. But how idea to be, how we think about idea as a laboratory, laboratory of thinking, laboratory of critical thinking. The problem with, the, with, with us, because we are fascinating but about what's happening with the Google, with, the, with this technology, but this technology, it's, it's still a tool and it will not stop. It will continue. And I think idea of laboratory in the museum is something very important. And that's why, why I think the new organization could be an artist-led artist communication organizations, maybe. So imagine if the communication and experimentation and leading of the new museum could shape by idea of an artist that keep it alive and cool and crazy sometime. That sounds exciting. I love that. <laughs> yes. So it's like a think tank. It's like a think tank or maybe I called it cultural mining projects. This is fascinating, Ahmed, because I don't think this is available in any museum today. We have acquisition committees. We have uh, circles, we have groups, uh, yes. but we don't have think tanks yes. uh, where uh, artists <laughs> are involved. Right? What I like about what you're saying, Ahmed, is that uh, at the end of the day, we sometimes forget that art is done by artists. And I think the institution probably doesn't do enough for artists. And, uh, and I think uh, I like your idea of this uh, laboratory of uh, um, artist-led uh, initiatives, I think is... Uh, I don't know. Pauline. So one, one of the things I was going to say, it's interesting you say this because I think that that is one of the things that Zaitz Mokka itself is, is starting to think about in terms of what exactly the role of this particular museum needs to be because just the background to the, to the museum is that it is housed in one of the, in the oldest um, grain silo in South Africa. So it wasn't purpose built. And if you, if you look at the, the program of, of, of Zaitzmoker, it differs from your traditional museums uh, where the, the, there's a focus on significant exhibitions that come in that are part of a global circuit. And what we're seeing with Zaitzmoker already is that there's a far greater focus on the artists themselves 
contributing to what they want to see happening at, at, at Zeitzmoker. And I think in a sense it's partly, con this, this outcome that we're seeing is partly as a consequence of the fact that there is very limited government funding that's available for maintaining the arts uh, to become, to keep them, to keep the arts vibrant. So just to put this in context, the largest national gallery in South Africa is called the National Gallery. And the government's allocated spend uh, for every year is 20,000 US dollars. That is next to nothing. So all these um, national galleries sit with the infrastructure almost derelict, but housing some incredible works of art. That said, we're beginning to see the, uh, the, the, the growth of uh, your privately owned institutes. We have something called the Maitland Institute in, 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 in Cape Town, which again is an artist-led construct where you have, you have artists come use the space and decide what it's going to be. And what I find very interesting is that in that decision, what you find more often than not is a combination. So it's not only an installation of a work of art, or it's not only putting up um, a, a painting. Often, more often than not, there is a mix of all of the arts. So there'll be a performance around that art in terms of an interpretation. There will be a Gerald Sekoto, who's one of our um, masters, whose work is interpreted into jazz music. So you'll have an evening of jazz where the, 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 the work is in fact being interpreted in a different way. So I think there are more and more exciting ways of, of, of looking at what a museum is going to look like, including the recognition of the fact that you have graffiti art. And for me, that in an, whenever I drive past the wall, I think that in fact could be seen to be a museum. There's something to be said about that because it tells you that you no longer need walls in the traditional sense. And when I look at your traditional um, museums, I see power. They represent what historically was the purpose of these institutions. They were there to uh, display the power of, of the conqueror in a sense. Absolutely. I, I, I loved what you said about the, the government funding $20,000 Thou $20, $20, per year. But this is where the private sector Absolutely. comes in, you know, because this is where now we see, is it wrong or is it normal where, the, where, where governments cannot fund the art sector? Is it wrong for groups like LVMH, like Caring, uh, like, you know, uh, Unilever, etc., to fund the arts? Because this is where money needs to be injected in order to have art fairs and biennials and or private banks even. Um, or vehicles like BMW, Mercedes-Benz, et cetera, et cetera, you know? So we do need these also private sectors to fund the art world. Is it wrong? <laughs> Is it because in, in the case of Africa, you're saying that- That's the only way that we can That's survive in Africa because Absolutely. there are so many competing uh, priorities, be it healthcare, be it education, the government sees those as fundamental human rights, but my personal view is similar to someone like Athiasta Gates who says that art is a human right. So quite frankly, at the end of the day, the decision is to focus on other social, trying to overcome other social challenges. Well, thank you gentlemen uh, in the back for triggering uh, and igniting <laughs> all this. Uh, any other questions? Yes, ma'am? Thank you for being here and hi. Sorry, Ahmed. can you speak louder, please? Yes, can you Thank hear you. me? Yes. Thanks for talking today. Um, I want to ask a question because I think, Katrin, you brought up having or the importance of arts education as one of the pillars, which I think is very true. And to not forget that the artist is, in a way, the starting point of a lot of this activity. Um, but also, I wanted to ask about the importance of the art professional in these contexts, and if you have the new, whether it's in South Africa with a new private foundation coming in, it's gonna have a staff of you know, 20, 40, 50 people or something like this, and just to talk a little bit about how to develop a strong uh, professional side to execute new scenes in addition to actually the structure for artists themselves um, and the wider institutional level of structures. A question uh, was for you. What is the question? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. How to, to, to yeah. train professional... If you don't mind rephrasing it in a, in a very sure, short shorter. sentence. So basically the artist 
him or herself is one of the pillars of a successful creative culture, as you were saying, but also the, the arts professional, the, the ones staffing these museums and institutions, et cetera, are, I would say, just as important to actually make it real. And that, so just to, if you could talk about that for a moment. I think yes. I, so, uh -huh. I, if I am understand, but I think I, 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 I think this is from the idea of a creative uh, economy or creative industry in the region, because really sometimes as artists, as an artist, and there is a lot of things that support these professionals. Administration. So very, very important. So it's a more about the ecosystem, again, about the creative industry yes. and how creative industry or yeah, yes. can yes. be uh, yes. work within yeah. I think maybe we're, much we're, better uh, skeleton or maybe yeah. I think we're, because we're, we have problem with the census bureau because everyone becoming with the same census bureau of the artists and the capital. Yeah. Maybe we change now the cultural capital to cultural so, 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 uh, <laughs> socialism. <Yeah. laughs> uh, I think that, uh, that what often happens in, a, in an emerging scene, I think that uh, often the institutions, especially uh, if they are led by wealthy foundations, yeah. uh, as has been the case uh, in the Middle East in many ways, yeah. or as is the case in China, I would say, uh, from what I see, uh, often institutions go ahead of the ecosystem <laughs> and they and they operate in a yes. vacuum. Um, I can think perhaps of uh, going many, many years ago, uh, I think when it opened, it first opened to the Islamic Art Museum in Qatar, in Doha, which is a, a jewel of a museum, uh, but lacks life. Uh, perhaps things are bet uh, better now. I'm going to go to Dubai next week or in two weeks for the art fair and, uh, and to week, see yeah. the Abu Dhabi um, uh, Louvre in particular. But I think that there is always that danger that uh, uh, institutions, uh, glittering and beautiful institutions, um, uh, operate in a cultural vacuum. And uh, even in more established scenes, uh, such as, for example, Mexico, I think you have a great uh, art school. You have a number of art schools, but there are really art schools that train artists and that have trained artists for many years. But to uh, train critical thinking, I think that's a lot more of a challenge. And that's where, in fact, we often see uh, artist-led initiatives. So, for example, in Mexico, there is a sc school uh, led by two artists that is called SOMA. They have a weekly program of uh, debates and talks and presentations by artists, a uh, uh, program of residencies and uh, of uh, curators as well as artists. And I think these initiatives are essential because I think the artists also resent working without being challenged, and I think that uh, we must encourage this. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I chair uh, in London a uh, small organization that is called Gasworks, Gasworks Triangle Network, and what we do is that we encourage a sort of a, um, 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 a periphery to periphery or institution to institution communication between artist-led institutions around the world in Africa, in Latin America. Um, I was just in Dhaka uh, in, um, for the Dhaka Art Summit in Bangladesh. And one of our partners is there, you know, working on a shoestring. We are working with uh, hardly any resources, but uh, backing the art school to create that critical approach. And I think uh, that is something perhaps where artist-led initiatives and um, a sort of small-scale initiatives can really fill the gap. I don't know if that answers perhaps uh, some of your questions. Thank and you. I, I don't, uh, if I can add to one thing. I don't know why I, from this question, I feel that there is a, an idea about how uh, the system now in, in contemporary art, or which is we cannot control, but it's really following even the idea of economical capital system in some way. Maybe that's true, cultural and art follow economy, or economy follow art and culture. And then this is, we talk about art and culture and the contemporary art like there is 
a capital stars famous uh, too 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 much we push it and when we see like for example like in, in Istanbul in the on fantastic artists who do the illuminations and the old things it was a group of artists usually the star is the final product more than half an uh, artistic uh, rock star artist, a contemporary art painter or something. So a factory. this is maybe almost, open uh, this a question for our time. I, I don't know because art, uh, art usually comes through longer process of professionalism, working not only with uh, one, because I, I feel the question, I don't know if it's... I think what you meant to say is that it is not only a think tank, as you said, but also a group of artists yeah. working on one big project, like it used to be with a collaboration. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. Collaboration, like usually, there is usually collaboration, but uh, maybe we're following the, uh, without, you know, like unconsciously with the eco economical system that we live w with now. Something to add to our think tank. <laughs> <Museum>. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think, oh, sorry, the lady in the front. Put the microphone. Hello. Hi. Uh, no, it's about the art market because I, didn't, I don't think we touched that. Um, how do you see in each region of yours? Is it getting more international or still local, majorly local buyers? Uh, you know what? I think um, I, have, I have the perfect example for you. Uh, when we started Canvas Magazine, which is the magazine we publish out of Dubai, uh, this was 15 years ago today. And the magazine, was, the magazine is a product of 9-11. So after September 11, we thought, you know, we need something to enhance the image of the region and to showcase the, the real talent of the region instead of what's being said in the news, et cetera, et cetera. So this was the sole reason why this magazine was created. In fact, we wanted to create a book called Les Musées du Monde Arabe, the museums of the Arab world, to showcase the history and the heritage of the Arab world. But then one thing led to another and we created the magazine. To cut a long story short, I was challenged a lot by a lot of people. People were saying, you know, there's no content, you're not gonna find enough artists, uh, the art market will not buy, you know, international art market. Two, three years down the line, I went to Art Basel Miami Beach, and one gentleman showed up at the booth of Canvas Magazine, he said, I really like the art on the cover. Who is it by? I said, it's by an Iranian artist uh, called so-and-so. He said, very beautiful, please take me to the gallery. Is it showing here? Luckily, the gallery was showing there. Then we found out this artist was an American Jewish gentleman who now started collecting art from the Middle East and now he has a fund to collect art from the Islamic world. A Jewish, I thought this was beautiful. Two hours later, Barbara Streisand comes to the stand and she asks me the same thing about the same artist again. I won't give you all the examples I have. I have plenty of examples to show you, but just to tell you that the art market in the beginning used to be 100% bought by Middle Easterners. Then two years later, four years later, six, 15 years later today, if you look at the Christie's auction results, the buyers are 50% international and 50% local. So it did change. Media plays a big role. Biennials play a big role. Patrons play a big role. Museums as well. But it definitely changes. I think the art market today is, was local, it became regional, and now it's very much international, I have to say. You see a lot of the Middle Eastern artists today in collections, uh, you know, such as in the Tate. You see them also in um, the Saatchi collection, and so on and so forth, even at the MoMA. So absolutely, Guggenheim as well, uh, Faride, not Faride Lashai. There was uh, Munir Farman Farmayan who had a, a solo show recently at the Guggenheim and so on and so forth. And Dr. Ahmad Mater, who has a, an exhibition today, a show today at, in the Brooklyn Museum, right? Correct, yeah. So it does change, for sure, from local to international. It takes a, a long time, though. <laughs> Sorry? It, it takes a, a while. To of course evolve. it takes a while, yeah, but it's organic. Yeah, exactly. It's organic. Thank you very much. I think uh, this is it, right? Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>